terrorism, law enforcement, and intelligence will come to order. This hearing is this subcommittee's second hearing focusing on the threats that the Chinese Communist Party poses to the U.S. homeland. The purpose of this hearing is to better understand how the federal government is responding to uh, the numerous threats posed by the CCP that impact the U.S. homeland and to identify vulnerabilities that must be resolved in the federal government's approach to mitigating these threats. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Subcommittee on Counterterrorism, Law Enforcement, and Intelligence second hearing exploring the threats the Chinese Communist Party poses to the U.S. homeland. I would like to thank all of our witnesses for testifying today. In March of this year, this subcommittee convened a hearing entitled Confronting Threats Posed by the Chinese Communist Party to the U.S. Homeland. During that hearing, with the support of testimony from national security experts, Members learned about the many ways in which the CCP is deceiving and manipulating the United States to commit espionage in the homeland and to overturn a global rules-based order. We also discussed the CCP's aggressive strategy, strategy of military-civil fusion and how it manifests as threats to our homeland. The subcommittee heard how the CCP is leveraging Confucius Institutes, programs the CCP claims are meant for language learning and cultural exchange, at U.S. universities and colleges to recruit American scientists and researchers to promote military civil fusion and suppress Chinese dissidents who are studying on American campuses. There is even evidence that the CCP is utilizing non-traditional intelligence collectors such as Chinese academic researchers to commit espionage in the U.S. homeland. We learned that the CCP has orchestrated the theft of anywhere between $225 and $600 billion in intellectual property annually according to the Commission on the Theft of American Intellectual Property. One of the witnesses, Bill Evanina, the former Director of National Counterintelligence and Security Center, put this into perspective for us, explaining that that equates to nearly $4,000 to $6,000 per American family of four after taxes. The subcommittee discussed the imminent threats the CCP poses to U.S. cybersecurity and critical infrastructure, as well as its efforts to undermine American economic security. Furthermore, we heard how the CCP is refusing to cooperate in international counter-narcotics efforts, tacitly approving of the traffic of illicit fentanyl and related precursor chemicals needed to produce fentanyl from China to Mexico, fueling the American opioid crisis. Today, we will revisit all of these pressing issues and more. The committee will hear from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, regarding the role that each of those uh, agencies play in mitigating CCP threats to the U.S. homeland. During this committee's worldwide threats hearing in November of 2022, FBI Director Ray stated that the greatest long-term threat to our nation's ideas, innovation, and economic security is the foreign intelligence and economic espionage threat from China. The FBI has investigated many cases of CCP intrusions including making critical arrests surrounding the illegal Chinese police station operating in Manhattan, New York. Arrests the committee asked DHS and FBI about in an April 24th letter uh, that remains unanswered at this point in time, and bringing those involved in the CCP's brazen cyber intrusions to justice. At the same time, DHS has begun to prioritize the threats posed by the CCP by crafting an unrealistic 90-day sprint that focuses on defending critical infrastructure, disrupting the global fentanyl supply chain, bolstering screening and vetting for illicit travelers from the People's Republic of China, mitigating PRC malign economic influence, securing the Arctic region, and mitigating counterintelligence threats posed by the PRC. While these efforts from both the FBI and DHS are necessary steps in the right direction, we must ensure countering the CCP is the highest priority for all entities involved in the homeland security enterprise. Unlike the Biden administration, previous administrations, including the Trump administration, acknowledged the threat posed by the CCP at a time when it was not popular to do so. For example, in November of 2018, the Department of Justice under the Trump administration launched the China Initiative to raise awareness and to identify and prosecute CCP trade secret theft and economic espionage and to protect American critical infrastructure and supply chains from CCP's malign influence. In February 2022, the DOJ ended the China Initiative, in which they said, 
in, in which they said was in favor of a broader approach to countering nation state threats. However, it appears the decision was motivated by nothing more than identity politics fueled by unfounded accusations that investigations under the initiative were excessive or racially biased. In fact, Assistant Attorney General Matthew Olson admitted that he had not seen any indication of bias or prejudice in decision-making by the Department of Justice in the related cases and that actions were driven, quote, were driven by genuine national security concerns. Following the scuttling of the China Initiative, security experts warned that the action emboldened China to increase its spying on the United States. In a similar fashion, on January 12th, 2021, in the final days of the Trump administration, DHS published the DHS Strategic Action Plan to counter the threat posed by the People's Republic of China. Again, January 12th, 2021. This comprehensive plan laid out four critical areas of focus for DHS to counter CCP malign efforts. They included border security and immigration, trade and economic security, cybersecurity and critical infrastructure, and maritime security. Following the transition to the Biden administration, DHS continued to work consistently on mitigating CCP threats from the component level. However, there was not a clear message regarding DHS headquarters priorities in the issue space until recently. On April 20th, 2023, Secretary Mayorkas issued the 90-day People's Republic of China threats sprint, displaying an encouraging shift in the department's focus to threats emanating from the CCP. However, 90 days is not sufficient to undo the CCP's 73-year-long campaign to undermine the United States and our national security interests. China has been racing ahead for decades while we sprint to catch up. We must do more. Both DHS and the FBI need to form long-term strategic plans like the ones established under the Trump administration that can counter evolving threats from the CCP now and into the future. I want to reiterate what I said when the subcommittee met for its first hearing this Congress. This conflict is not with the individual citizens of the PRC. This conflict is with the CCP, an authoritarian regime that commits genocide against its own people, censors free speech across the globe, and aims to end democracy as we know it. We must ensure we are enacting common sense policy and strategy that can mitigate CCP aggression in the homeland. We need to rise above personal politics and confront the grave security threat posed by the CCP together. I hope that during this discussion, we can have a bipartisan hearing that talks about the threats, that gets rid of the distractions that I think have captured the politics over the last two years and really focus on what is happening from the CCP as it affects our own homeland. I'd now like to recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Magaziner, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman, for calling today's hearing, and thank you to our witnesses for appearing today. It is indisputable that the Chinese Communist Party is the United States' greatest competitor on the world stage, and it is also indisputable that the CCP is actively trying to undermine the economy and security of the United States. Uh, as I noted in our hearing on the topic in March, uh, it is important to be clear here that our adversary is the CCP, as they have become more aggressive in trying to undermine U.S. interests, uh, not uh, the Chinese people or people of Chinese descent living and working in the United States. Anyone who targets individuals based on their race or national origin must be condemned and must be prosecuted appropriately. Now, it is important to highlight that this competition we find ourselves in with the CCP touches on many areas, from defense to foreign policy to political ideology, but it is first and foremost an economic competition. That is why the CCP has aggressively pursued unfair economic practices like currency devaluation, the use of weak and inhumane labor standards, and in particular, intellectual property theft, targeting both the United States government agencies and United States companies in their effort to usurp our global economic leadership. The CCP routinely engages in espionage and cyber exploitation to steal American intellectual property, trade secrets, and defense information. 
Each year, the CCP's economic espionage against American businesses costs between $225 and $600 billion, according to the FBI. In 2020, just one Chinese national stole intellectual property worth a billion dollars from his employer, a United States petroleum company. A billion dollars stolen by just one individual. And last year, a Boston-based cybersecurity firm found that a Chinese state actor had exfiltrated hundreds of gigabytes of IP and sensitive data from about 30 companies around the world. The estimated cost of that IP loss runs into the trillions. But even more alarming is that the intellectual property stolen by the CCP did not just include commercial product designs and trademarks for cheap knockoff counterfeit products. It included blueprints for fighter jets, helicopters, missiles, pharmaceuticals, and large-scale technologies. These thefts of intellectual property and trade secrets threaten our national defense and also our economic advantage, hurting our companies and costing American jobs. And the CCP does not plan to stop. In fact, they have become more assertive. The CCP's Made in China 2025, or MIC 2025 initiative, lays out a broad set of industrial plans to boost China's economic fortunes by advancing its position in manufacturing and supply chains. Over the past decade, the CCP has also used foreign investments through its Belt and Road Initiative to develop China-centered and controlled global infrastructure, transportation, trade, and production networks. But importantly, this initiative is more than just an economic challenge. It is expanding China's reach into hundreds of companies around the world and, troublingly, uh, building gener uh, digital networks that are giving the Chinese Communist Party access to troves of sensitive data from around the world, which can be used against United States interests. Now, I am pleased that under the leadership of President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas, DHS issued the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, the first in nine years, including a focus on threats related to the CCP. The 2023 review directly tackles the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party to our competitiveness, dec democratic institutions, and homeland security. I am also uh, pleased that the Biden administration has taken the threat of the CCP seriously with the passage of the Chips and Science Act, the establishment of the China House at the State Department, and the launch of the 90-day sprint at DHS. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses about the broad threats to the United States from the Chinese Communist Party, and in hearing how the uh, DHS and FBI work with federal partners across our country to protect American businesses and government from CCP espionage. Finally, I look forward to hearing how DHS is implementing the Biden administration's quadrennial Homeland Security Review and receiving an update on the status of the DHS 90-day sprint on China. Thank you again to our witnesses for being here today, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Magaziner. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. Without objection, the gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. Marjorie Taylor Greene, is permitted to sit on the dais and ask questions of the witnesses. And without objection, the chair may declare the committee in recess at any point in time. I'm pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today on this very important topic. And I ask that the witnesses please rise and raise their right hands. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the Committee on Homeland Security of the United States House of Representatives will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. May be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. I'd like to now like to formally introduce our witnesses. Ms. Jill Murphy is the Deputy Assistant Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Counterintelligence Division. Ms. Murphy began her career with the FBI in 2002. Her initial work with the FBI included investigations of Asian organized crime in America and worked with the Joint Terrorism Task Force to focus on the fight against Al Qaeda and its affiliates. In 2010, Ms. Murphy transitioned to the China Counterintelligence Division at FBI headquarters. From 2014 to 2016, she served on the National Security Council as Director of Counterintelligence, coordinating counterintelligence policy and operations. Most recently, Ms. Murphy worked as the CIA's Chief of Counterespionage. Welcome. Next, Mr. Ranga Kahangama is the Assistant Secretary for Cyber, Infrastructure, Risk, and Resilience at the Department of Homeland Security. 
Previously, he served as, at the White House and the National Security Council as Director for Cyber Incident Response. In that role, he oversaw the federal government's response to a wide range of malicious cyber activity, including the Russia-attributed solar winds incident, China's exploitation of Microsoft Exchange servers, and ransom attacks, ransomware attacks on the Colonial Pipeline. Prior to the NSC, he served as Senior Policy Advisor at the FBI, working on an array of cyber, internet, and technology policy issues. Welcome. Finally, Mr. Tyrone Durham currently serves as the Acting Director of the Nation State Threat Center in the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Intelligence and Analysis. In this role, Mr. Durham oversees the center's efforts to identify and assess foreign adversarial threats to the U.S. homeland, primarily in the areas of counterintelligence, trade, and supply chain, as well as intellectual property. Before this role, Mr. Durham was the Senior Advisor for Cyber and Senior Subject Matter Expert at DHS Cyber Mission Center. Prior to joining DHS, Mr. Durham served more than two decades in intelligence with the FBI in its New York field office and headquarters criminal, counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and cyber programs. Welcome and thank you. Uh, and Mr. Durham concluded his career at the FBI as unit chief in the FBI's Counterintelligence Division, identifying and assessing threats from the People's Republic of China. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, before we uh, proceed, I ask unanimous consent that Ms. Jackson Lee be permitted to sit on the subcommittee and question the witnesses. So ordered. I'd like to thank all the witnesses for being here today, and then I recognize Ms. Jill Murphy. Uh, if you will, Ms. Murphy, and for all the witnesses, I know you have written statements. Thank you for those. Please do uh, summarize the statements uh, and stick to five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Pfluger, Ranking Member Magaziner, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the FBI's counterintelligence work against the People's Republic of China and the ways the FBI works with members of the U.S. intelligence community, public and private entities, the American people to protect the U.S. homeland from the communist government of China. Our nation faces a wider than ever array of challenging threats. We see nations such as China, Russia, and Iran becoming more aggressive and more capable in their nefarious activity than ever before. These nations seek to undermine our core democratic values, our economic and scientific institutions. They employ a growing range of tactics to advance their interests and to harm the United States. Defending American institutions and values against these threats is a national security imperative and a priority for the FBI. With that, the greatest long-term threat to our nation's ideas, innovation, and economic security is the foreign intelligence and economic espionage threat from China. It's a threat to our economic security and by extension, our national security. The China government aspires to equal or surpass the United States as a global superpower and influence the world with a value system shaped by undemocratic authoritarian ideas. The pursuit of these goals is often with little regard for international norms or laws. And when it comes to economic espionage, the Chinese government uses every means at its disposal against us, blending cyber, human, diplomacy, corporate transactions, pressure on US companies operating in China to achieve its strategic goals to steal our company's innovations. <coughs> Excuse me. These efforts are consistent with China's express goal to become a national power, modernizing its military and creating innovative driven economic growth. To pursue this goal, China not only uses human intelligence officers, co-optees, non-traditional collectors, as you mentioned, sir, um, corporate, uh, corrupt corporate insiders, but also sophisticated cyber intrusions, pressures, pressure on US companies, shell game corporate transactions, joint venture partnerships that are anything but a true partnership. They also, uh, there's nothing traditional about the scale of their theft. It's unprecedented in the history of the FBI. American workers and companies are facing greater, more complex danger than they've ever dealt with before. Stolen innovation means stolen jobs, stolen opportunities for work, and stolen national power, and stolen leadership in these industries. The Chinese government targets cutting edge research and innovation at our university as well as in private industry. This is no secret. The Chinese government publicizes the key technologies they tend to target and acquire. The Made in China 25 plan, for example, lists 10 broad areas spanning industries like robotics, green energy production, agricultural equipment, aerospace, and biopharma. The government of China's 14th, 15 year plan, or five year plan, targets things like AI, quantum, semiconductors, brain science, 
smart manufacturing robotics. The government of China is willing to lie, cheat, and steal their way into unfairly dominating entire tech sectors, putting competing U.S. companies out of business. And they aren't just interested in technology. The Chinese government is interested in cost and pricing information, internal strategy documents, bulk PII, anything that can give them a competitive advantage. The Chinese government is fighting a generational fight to surpass our country in economic and technological leadership, but not through legitimate innovation, not through fair and lawful competition, and not by giving their citizens the freedom of thought and speech and creativity that we treasure here in the United States. <coughs> the Chinese government makes American ventures operating in China establish Chinese community party cells within their companies. These, the companies operating in China are susceptible to the laws and regulations of the Chinese government, which enables it stealing the stealing of US information and technology. The American people and businesses should know if you're an owner, a security official, an employee of a US business, no matter the size, and you create cutting edge technology in the semiconductor, quantum, computing, AI, machine learning, new energy, biotech, aerospace, robotics, the list goes on or you create a widget or a software component that contributes to the manufacturing process of one of these technologies, your company's intellectual property and employees are targets of sophisticated nation state actors like China, both here in the United States and abroad. To be clear, this is not about the Chinese people or as, or, uh, as a whole or Chinese Americans. This is about a threat emanating from the Chinese Communist Party which controls the Chinese government. Finally, the strength of any organization is its people. The threats we face as a nation have never been greater or more diverse, and the expectations on the FBI have never been higher. Our fellow citizens look to the FBI to protect the United States from all threats, and the people of the FBI, to con and the people of the FBI continue to meet and exceed those expectations every day. I want to thank them for their dedicated service. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Uh, the chair now recognizes for his opening statement, Mr. Kangama. Thank you. Chairman Fluker, ranking member, magaziner, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here today to testify about threats and vulnerabilities to the homeland posed by the People's Republic of China. The Department of Homeland Security shares your concerns and looks forward to working with you to address these pressing challenges. The department is on the front lines of countering these threats and takes this mission seriously and with the highest attention. Today, I will talk to you about the multi-pronged approach this department is taking to address our vulnerabilities in the homeland, and perhaps even more importantly, how we are making our country more resilient. As the administration's national security strategy states and the national cybersecurity strategy reiterates, the PRC is our only competitor with both in the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to do so. In cyberspace, our interconnectedness and the technology that enables it exposes us to a dynamic and evolving threat that Beijing actively exploits, one that is cont not contained by borders or centralized actors. The PRC also routinely engages in transnational repression using illegal tactics to surveil, threaten, and harass targets, both in person and digitally around the globe. Such attempts circumvent established means of law enforcement cooperation and directly violate our sovereignty. It highlights that the PRC often lacks a legal basis for pursuing such targets. On economic security, the PRC abuses legal avenues such as foreign investment and international trade to exploit our open rules-based system in pursuit of a zero-sum approach to global competition. This approach seeks to undermine American leadership, security, prosperity, and competitiveness. DHS is unwavering in its commitment to countering the PRC's whole of government threat by providing a whole of, whole of homeland response, whether in cyberspace, in defense of our critical infrastructure, our economic security, or preventing the assault on democratic values and freedoms. As Secretary Mayorkas made clear when recently directing DHS to engage in a 90-day sprint on the PRC threat, Beijing poses an especially grave threat to the homeland one that touches all of our department's missions. We must ensure that we are poised to guard against this threat, not only today, but well into the future. We defend against threats to cyberspace and our critical infrastructure through the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. 
CISA works to shine a light on the tactics, techniques, and procedures the PRC uses against our vulnerable systems, frequently in concert with interagency and international partners. The private sector, who own and operate most of the critical infrastructure in this country, are also essential partners in our collective efforts against PRC threats. CISA established the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative to bring together state, local, tribal, and territorial partners with private sector partners to conduct real-time information sharing. Our law enforcement components, Secret Service, Homeland Security Investigations, and Customs and Border Protection work with partners to counter PRC intellectual property theft, goods made by forced labor, and instances of transnational repression. The Coast Guard is actively ensuring the security of our ports and maritime sector, including from equipment made by PRC state-owned enterprises. The Transportation Security Administration is also on the front lines of securing our various transportation nodes be they surface or air. In addition to addressing these very real homeland security concerns, the department also recognizes that these are threats posed by the PRC government and not the people of China or of Chinese origin. The department condemns all forms of anti-Asian hate and discrimination and actively works with these communities to ensure their protection. This is particularly relevant as I sit here before you today during Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Chairman Fluger, by holding this hearing today, it is clear to the subcommittee that the subcommittee takes seriously the threat to the homeland posed by the PRC. DHS knows that we are not alone in this challenge and we thank you for your commitment. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes for his opening statement, Mr. Durham. Thank you. Chairman Fluger, ranking member Magaziner, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today where my testimony will provide an overview of the complex threat to the homeland from the government of the People's Republic of China. Let me be clear about the intent of my opening statement and testimony. At no time should anything I communicate be taken as aspersions against the people of China or against any Chinese or other Asian Americans in the United States. My comments and testimony pertain solely to the actions, policies, practices, and procedures of the Chinese government. The increasingly aggressive activities of the PRC represent significant threats to the homeland as the PRC continues to challenge the United States by using a whole of government approach to undercut our competitiveness and democracy. The PRC uses an innovative combination of traditional and non-traditional intelligence tradecraft, cyber espionage, and predatory economic methods to gain illicit access to U.S. critical infrastructure and steal American innovation, along with research, technology, and other intellectual property. The PRC exploits our academic and scientific communities by compelling some foreign students, scholars, and researchers to identify and collect sensitive information and research. It also uses talent recruitment programs to acquire the technical know-how to exploit the information that it stole. The PRC's top-tier cyber espionage and attack capabilities represent significant ongoing threats to the U.S. public and private sector interests. The PRC uses cyber means to illicitly obtain U.S. intellectual property, personally identifiable information, and export controlled information. They're pushed to develop their own industrial base and to secure access to critical supply chains for manufacturing, research, and social stability likely includes investments in the United States using subversion to gain access to new technologies, businesses, and research institutions. PRC firms also engage in various licit and illicit investment strategies to acquire real estate and other assets and gain proximate access to targets in the homeland for malign purposes. Moreover, through its national security laws, the PRC could compel organizations and citizens to comply with state intelligence efforts, thereby expanding its whole of government effort to a whole of society effort targeting the homeland. To meet these challenges, DHS remains committed to sharing information with our partners to mitigate threats to the homeland. The Office of Intelligence and Analysis placed intelligence officers locally in every fusion center across the nation to share information related to intelligence threats from the PRC and other foreign adversaries. And the, the department works closely with Homeland Security Advisors and the private sector in every state and territory 
to increase the resiliency and preparedness of our communities. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Durham. Members will now be recognized in order of seniority for their five minutes of questioning. Uh, an additional round of questioning may be called after all members have been recognized. I now recognize myself uh, for five minutes of questioning. And I appreciate all of your testimonies, uh, the seriousness with, with which you take this threat. Um, I do want to highlight that last month, uh, the FBI made two arrests related to the secret Chinese police station operating in New York City and charged dozens more as part of a larger PRC uh, efforts to locate in America pro-democracy Chinese uh, activists and others who are openly critical of Beijing's policies and to suppress their speech. On the 24th of April, uh, Chairman Green um, and myself sent a letter to both DHS and to the FBI uh, requesting additional information uh, about this police station. Um, it's now been two, over two weeks past that deadline that we asked for, so I would ask you please to respond to that letter in writing uh, and to highlight that. Uh, it's very important that we understand uh, what has happened, but um, you know this Manhattan-based police station was operating, operating as a provincial branch for the Ministry of Public Security, which belongs to the Commerce Entity List for its implication in human rights violations. My question, and uh, we'll start with Ms. Murphy, is how was this, how was the station associated with such a nefarious organization? How did it pop up in New York City? Thank you for the question, sir. Uh, and I'm happy to work with the team so we can get you a more fulsome uh, response, probably in a classified setting. Um, as you know, and as you remarked in your opening statement, the threat from China is complex and vast. Uh, and the way that they work in the United States, and I imagine in other countries, um, who are seeing similar threats from the communist government of China, is very diversified and layered. Um, so when we talk about universities or researchers or academics or innovation, China proliferates all those spaces to include in our communities where Chinese Americans live mm. as a way to influence um, those communities. And we work actively to identify those um, and investigate would, them. Would you say that they're using every available tactic, technique, and procedure to infiltrate American national security interest and interest writ large? I would say that they their attack surface is large okay. and they are using all the tools in their toolbox to gather information, whether it's classified, intellectual property, sensitive, unclassified, anything of, that they consider of value. Okay, uh, we'll follow up on that um, a little bit later. I'd like to go to you know the well-documented approach that they've used uh, to acquiring either critical minerals, critical industries, farmland, ranch land, some of them near military sites, especially sensitive military sites. Uh, Mr. Kangama, can you comment on um, the acquisition of this farmland and has DHS or FBI overlaid the flight path of that Chinese spy balloon that came over the United States several months ago with acquisition, acquired land, um, and, and anything else that would be of note? Thank you for the question, Chairman. I would defer some of those questions to our intelligence colleagues about specifics about what happened, but what I can mention is that we do feel that we have tools to address these types of concerns. First, to your point about land acquisitions, I think thanks to Congress as well, uh, real estate purchases are now included as within the purview of what we call uh, CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. So we do have an ability to look at uh, land purchases when they have a nexus specifically to uh, military sites or what would be uh, airports or seaports and conduct a risk assessment if a foreign purchase of that uh, is subject to foreign control. And so we do feel that we have uh, some, uh, some uh, tools against that. With the balloon specifically, DHS's uh, CISA did track the flight path of the balloon and critical infrastructure nodes that were associated with it. I believe CISA conducted about uh, 27 notifications and outreach to state and local and critical infrastructure entities to help them understand and mitigate against the risk. Did it appear that the overflight path was actually over uh, acquisitions by CCP-related entities? Uh, I don't have that information, okay. but I'll defer to my intelligence colleagues. Um, I'll do a follow-up here for Mr. Durham. Um, we, we've heard about you know, all the variety of threats um, and, and, and what Mr. Kanagama just talked about uh, with the land acquisitions. Uh, could you speak to the uh, the threats of CCP-owned agricultural operations and, and the, the um, effect that has on our supply chains and our nation's food security? 
Thank you, Chairman, for that question. Uh, I think one of the things we know about the CCP is that it, their actions and activities are strategic and long-term. And we've taken a specific set of individuals in the organization and built a team around PRC activities to better understand exactly what they're doing in terms of their ag ag agricultural purchases and such. And we believe we have information that we could provide to you in a classified setting to better elucidate their activities. Thank you. Um, my time has expired. Uh, we have multiple requests out to both of your agencies uh, for those classified briefings, and we expect those to be filled. I now uh, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Magaziner, for his line of question. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, there's a lot we could touch on here, but I want to focus my initial questions on the issue of IP theft. Um, there's obviously a national security imperative that we protect the intellectual property and trade secrets of uh, our defense um, industry and, and related industries. But there's also an economic imperative that we protect American companies and American jobs from intellectual property theft. Uh, when uh, an American manufacturer or uh, an American agricultural firm has their intellectual property stolen, that ultimately costs American jobs. And so uh, I'll start with um, Mr. Uh, Kahangama. Um, the 2023 Quadrennial Homeland Security Review warns that the CCP is seeking to acquire our intellectual property and sponsoring a relentless barrage of cyber attacks that threaten our competitiveness. Can you describe for us how DHS is working with industry partners and other federal agencies to shore up our vulnerabilities and guard against the theft of intellectual property? Absolutely, thank you for that uh, question, ranking member. Uh, this is an utmost priority for the department. Uh, a lot of our efforts are led through the uh, Homeland Security Investigations Intellectual Property Rights Center, the IPR Center, and that is an interagency collaboration center where we are able to have industry come in, provide them threat briefings, conduct information sharing, and otherwise uh, provide uh, uh, specific threat information to some of these targeted entities. I think the cybersecurity angle is very important as well. Our cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency is actively working on addressing specific PRC cyber threats because the, the best indicator of uh, what is gonna be stolen is what's already been exploited. And so we've done things like publish lists of known vulnerabilities that the PRC has already exploited and push that information out so that industries, uh, sensitive technology holders and others can patch those holes and otherwise protect themselves. Uh, we've also conducted a wide array of uh, briefings, both classified and unclassified, to uh, share this threat with them and continue to engage in real-time information sharing. Thank you. And I'll, I'll ask a similar question to Ms. Murphy. Can you talk about what the FBI is doing, again, with other federal agencies and with private sector partners to help protect American intellectual property and, in so doing, protect American jobs? Absolutely. This is a top priority for me and for the FBI. Um, there's a lot of, obviously, nuance to this threat um, and different layers. And so let's start with the innovation in emerging tech society. Um, we've learned through interactions that venture capitalists are the best at d identifying the tech that is going to actually succeed because their money depends upon it. And so we've done extensive outreach, especially in the San Francisco area, with venture capitalists to try and identify what that tech is to help protect that. But we also know through our outreach that smaller uh, entrepreneurs don't have the money to invest in protecting their intellectual property or in cybersecurity. Um, so we've done a lot of outreach in that space to try and educate people about intellectual property and that those efforts are ongoing. When we talk about delivering uncompromised technology to our warfighters, um, when there's places like AFWorks or AFC that's doing outreach to the emerging tech space, we work closely with them to try and protect the technologies that they're bringing in from principal research um, all the way through into classified space in their labs. So it's a space that we're very focused on and we're doing a lot of outreach on and I think that will continue and grow. Thank you. And just one more question on this topic for, for uh, uh, any of you. Uh, if there are people watching this hearing from home, you know, who may own a business or run a business or, you know, run a, you know, a local utility or other piece of critical infrastructure, uh, what can you do for them? Like, what are the resources for the people who are watching at home who want to know what their vulnerabilities are, who want to know how to protect themselves? Can they reach out to DHS? Can they reach out to the FBI? And, and what services can you offer to help them protect themselves? 
I think both agencies, I'll pass it over to Aranga, but I think both agencies offer different tools um, to help depending on the range of what they're looking at, whether it's from cybersecurity, educational and protecting intellectual property, insider threat. I think both agencies have tools and I would encourage them to reach out. Thank you, if I could just follow up. Uh, CISA specifically at CISA.gov, their website has actual free services that cost nothing that small and, small and medium businesses can download and utilize to effectively scan their systems and understand the threat picture. Uh, they can also reach out to, uh, to CISA for a little bit more uh, specific and in-depth uh, uh, vulnerability assessments, but there are a number of free tools on our website. Thank you, and, and for those watching at home, CISA is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, so we encourage everybody to uh, take advantage of those services, and I yield back. Gentlemen, uh, as time has expired, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina and the chairman of the subcommittee on oversight, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Murphy, a good bit of your testimony focuses on, I know this hearing subject matter is, uh, is the threats from China, and some of those are covered, but a lot of your written testimony focuses on the FBI's Foreign Influence Task Force. That is part of, that is, uh, comes under the counterintelligence division that you're the deputy director of, correct? That, there's three deputy assistant directors in the counterintelligence division. The Foreign Influence Task Force actually falls under a different deputy assistant director, but it okay. is in the counterintelligence division. But in the division, okay. Um, has the division, has the Foreign Influence Task Force changed its practices any as a result of the revelations from the Twitter files or from the uh, litigation undertaken by the attorneys general for Louisiana and Missouri? So, sir, I would have to take that question back to the team and get you an answer. I'm, I'm not aware of, of their processes or any changes that they've made. Do, are, are you familiar with the work of that? Of that? And you, you certainly, you've read the Twitter files, I assume. I have not. You've not read any of it? No. Interesting. Are you aware um, that the FBI regularly meets or met before the 2020 election with the, um, uh, with the uh, social media platforms? I saw the media reporting on that. Okay. Um, what, um, are they still meeting in the same way with the social media platforms? Sir, I would have to take that question back. I'm, I personally am not meeting with the social media companies in my role. Okay. And, and you receive no reporting and you're otherwise unfamiliar internally with the, with the activities of the Foreign Influence Task Force insofar as their interactions and engagement with social media platforms is concerned? No, sir. I, that's not part of my, my role or my purview uh, and my job. I see. Um, do you, uh, let me ask this question. One of the, perhaps the most effective operation by the uh, counter foreign malign influence operation uh, by the FBI in the 2020 election was convincing social media not to, or, or to suppress the Hunter Biden laptop story by preparing them uh, to be on the lookout for hack and dump operations. Um, do, did the FBI know at that time the content of the Hunter Biden laptop, which it had in its possession by means of a subpoena? Sir, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to respectfully refer you to the, to the attorney that's prosecuting that case. Who are the other deputy directors, uh, in addition to yourself, in the counterintelligence division? Uh, Scott Grady is the deputy director of our intelligence, and right now we have an acting director, uh, Roman Rosnowski, over uh, Russia and other countries. Which one supervises the Foreign Influence Task Force? Scott Grady. Okay. Um, do you, you've written uh, about foreign malign influence in your testimony. In fact, of the testimony, which is only about three and a half pages, a full page of it is, is about foreign malign influence, actually a page and a half. What do you know personally about the FBI's actions against foreign malign influence? In those, in those instances, sir, it would be things like the police station and the Chinese influence in the United States against uh, Chinese Americans living here or Chinese uh, persons being in the United States that they're trying to repress or take back. What about the portion that, uh, uh, let's see if I can find something here. What about this part? You said coordinating with closely with our partners and leveraging relationships we have developed in the technology sector, we had several instances where we were able to quickly relay threat indicators 
that those companies, speaking of social media companies, used to take swift action, blocking budding abuse of their platforms. What do you know, what do you know about that? Sir, sort of that, that might be a reference to our work with foreign partners. Well, this is in your written testimony before the committee. Let me, let me give you a fuller context. It says this better, some of the FTI, FITF brings the FBI's national security and traditional criminal investigative expertise under one umbrella to prevent foreign influence in our elections. This better enables us to frame the threat, to identify connections across programs, to aggressively investigate as appropriate, and importantly, to be more agile. And then you talked, and then that last sentence I read. So do you, or do you personally not have knowledge of that since you don't actually deal with the FT, FITF? So, so the, as I stated, the Foreign Intelligence Task Force falls under DAD, Scott Grady. Um, you know, like I've seen, as I mentioned, the media reports. You know, like I know that there's engagements, but those aren't part of my role, and that's not part, something that I take part of. I was curious that it's included in your testimony in that case. I'd ask you more, but I guess my time's expired, so I'll yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now uh, recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Goldman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Um, Mr. Durham, I appreciated uh, very much you saying in your opening statement that your comments are not directed at uh, Chinese Americans or AAPI individuals uh, who are in this country, but at the Chinese government. And uh, I have a district with uh, more, that is more than 20% AAPI, uh, much of which is of Chinese descent. And the hateful rhetoric that has uh, come from our former president and others over the last several years has led to a record increase in hate crime, especially against uh, those of uh, Chinese descent. And, and I want to talk a little bit about the distinction that you are drawing, which I think is an important one, particularly as it relates to the so-called police stations that the Chinese government has set up uh, at various places around the world, including in our country. Um, uh, Ms. Murphy, I'm, I'm sure you are aware, and, and the chairman rep referenced this uh, case, the uh, two arrests in my district of two uh, Chinese nationals for operating a one of these uh, police stations, which um, so everybody is clear, is really designed to track Chinese dissidents or Chinese citizens in the United States, uh, essentially as an unsanctioned uh, police station, so to speak. Now, I'm assuming, uh, Ms. Murphy, you are not going to be able to speak uh, much about that specific prosecution, but can you tell us... Um, more broadly, st taking a step out of that prosecution, what the FBI understands about these, uh, these police stations and the effort of the Chinese government to intimidate and threaten Chinese, uh, either citizens or dissidents who are living in this country? Thank you for the question. Um, as I think the committee is aware, you know, China goes through great lengths to control the narrative uh, about the country of China. And this is a way that they use influence and intimidation tactics uh, against people that are in the United States that may have ties to China or views about China that the Chinese government doesn't agree with. And so it doesn't just happen here in the United States, it happens in other countries too. We work proactively to identify and then investigate these instances, um, whether they're identified as police stations or liaison bureaus. We also work with foreign partners when we find information to share with them and they share back with us. Can you describe some of the tactics that the Chinese government uses? Sure. Um, they, it's, uh, I think on the same day that the arrest in New York happened, we also announced an indictment against NPS for, uh, for using a... Can you just, sorry, what is NPS? Uh, the Ministry of Public Security. I think it's probably better for a classified session, but they use tactics such as harassment, um, threatening relatives overseas. Uh, they can act like they are, uh, you know, the arm of the government here. They use, you know, wide ranging intimidation tactics. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kahongama, I'm not sure 
or, or Mr. Durham, I'm not sure if either one of you is, uh, is the specific DHS witness to address this, but I, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, the Chinese governmental efforts to interfere in elections, uh, both in this country as well as others, including Canada. Um, to the extent that you can talk about this in an unclassified setting, what, um, where do things stand with those efforts um, as we are, are moving forward toward 2024? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Unfortunately, I will not be able to talk about that in this session, but I'm more than willing to arrange a classified session for you with, with regard to that question. Uh, th th I'm not, not surprised. Um, but it is something I think we are, uh, we are particularly concerned about, and I know um, the Foreign Influence Task Force, FITF, was created in, in part to address the efforts uh, of foreign entities to interfere in our elections and to uh, try to infiltrate our national security. So um, I do hope that we are all, all of you three and your agencies are very much focused on this and making sure that our election infrastructure is as strong as it can be. And my time is now up, so thank you for the time and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Crane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, to the panelists who have come here today to share your time. Uh, Ms. Murphy, you work for the FBI, is that correct? Yes, sir. Ms. Murphy, do you know what elite capture is? Elite capture? Yeah, do you know what elite capture is? No, sir. So basically, elite capture is used by the CCP as a form of political warfare that seeks to control the actions of political, academic, business, and cultural leaders outside of China to benefit the CCP. The means of control take a variety of forms, including financial incentives, financial dependence, or compromised business entanglements, offers of access to opportunities within China, ideological appeal, and even blackmail. Are you familiar with um, these techniques, ma'am? I am familiar with those techniques. Do you have experience with those techniques? seeing those techniques in your job? Experience in seeing the Chinese government use those techniques? Yeah, or any other nation state that wants to compromise US officials. I don't know that I've seen them personally, um, but I'm familiar with those techniques, yes sir. Okay. Ms. Murphy, are you aware that a Chinese spy balloon uh, just recently flew over the US for about a week? I am. Ms. Murphy, are you aware that the CCP is buying up US farmland near military bases? I've heard reports of that. I don't know what evidence I've seen of it. Okay. Ms. Murphy, does it concern you some of the uh, revelations that have been coming out of the Oversight Committee about the millions of dollars that have been paid to the Biden family recently? I'm not aware of money being paid to the Biden family. Oh, you're not aware of that at all? No, sir. That's interesting. You're the, you, you work for the FBI, right? Yes, sir, I do, but I would respectfully refer you to the, the investigators over that case. I'm sure we can get you a brief on that. The, that is not a case that, that I handle. Yeah, well, I don't need a brief on that, ma'am, to know that there are nation states that have paid millions of dollars to the Biden family. And that's one of the reasons that we're having this hearing. That's one of the reasons that Americans are so concerned that they see Chinese spy balloons flying over the U.S. for an entire week. That's why they're so concerned that they see these Chinese police stations being set up here, and they're wondering, how could this go on? This doesn't make any sense. And yet, the son of the President of the United States is involved and entangled for many years now in multiple business deals that the President claims he knows nothing about. And you, ma'am, you sit here before the Homeland Security Committee. Our job is to protect the homeland, and you act as if you don't know anything about it. You understand why the American people are concerned, ma'am? Yes or no? I understand why American people should be concerned about the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah. Do you see any connections with what I talked about when I was talking about elite capture? Do you see, are you connecting the dots at all? No, sir. You don't connect the dots? So your job is to protect the American people 
I just read you what elite capture is, the summary, the definition of elite capture. Everybody knows in this town what's going on. Everybody knows what's coming out of these committee hearings right now. And it's pretty sad coming from somebody who as a young man wanted to be a part of your organization because of the reputation that men and women from the FBI had built up over decades. And now the American people hardly trust the FBI. They struggle with the Department of Justice, quite frankly, generally. They feel as if, if you don't have the right politics, you can basically do whatever you want. The American people, quite honestly, are wondering why Hunter Biden is still walking the streets. Thank you, I yield back. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Let me thank the chair and ranking member, as always, for their courtesies. Let me be as delicate as I can possibly be and certainly express uh, my friendship to all of the members on the other side of the aisle. Uh, but I would offer to say that I have the highest respect for the FBI. Uh, as I've worked with uh, the Bureau for over 28 years, I was here in the United States Congress after 9-11 during 9-11, ran for my life from the United States Capitol, I went to ground zero during the recovery, watched the pain of firefighters removing remains, and uh, watched the intensive investigation that was augmented by the work of the FBI. We created the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and I could not be more proud of the work uh, that the department has done in particular was key in stopping the potential attack uh, at the beginning um, as, a, as a number of terrorists um, potential came in um, after 9-11. Uh, we were still concerned about international terrorism. We now know that according to the FBI that the number one terrorist act against all of us is domestic terrorism as evidenced by January 6th. I'm very glad, uh, Mr. Durham, that you made it very clear that this hearing should not be about Chinese Americans, patriots, uh, families, students, teachers, doctors, people in my community of Houston, Texas. I want them to know that this hearing, I could not sit in this hearing if this was an attack on Asian Americans, Chinese Americans, and we have seen the rise in hatred. And so as I noticed that your position deals with nation state threats, let, let us be framed uh, particularly uh, about what we're doing here. I, I have to respect my friend, but I haven't gotten one question about Hunter Biden, and I haven't seen uh, any uh, association with Mr. Biden, uh, with the President of the United States of America, short of the fact that as parents, we all have our children and we love them. So let me just uh, ask um, uh, Ms. Murphy, you indicated you were getting information, but right now you have not come here to discuss Hunter Biden, is that correct? That's correct, ma'am. Okay. No, you're here to discuss the President of the United States, uh, connectedness to Hunter Biden, other than your recognition that it's his father. That's correct. Thank you so very much. Um, Mr. Durham, and I have some questions I need to get to quickly, but I just wanna make sure, am, am I correct as you made your opening remarks that this hearing, or you did not come here to attack Chinese Americans who are uh, patriots serving in respective responsibilities across America, in the Asian American community. That's correct, Congresswoman. You're not here to promote hate based upon our responsibilities in national security. That's correct, I am Thank not. you so very much. I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on the responsibilities that we have here today. Let me just say that uh, as a member, I've had uh, the Chinese from the government approach my staff. I've had them approach me. I am the congresswoman in the area where the Chinese consulate had to be closed down, rightly so by the former administration. We welcome that. I'm not a stranger, uh, but I recognize that we must discern in order to be intelligent. 
Let me quickly say in today's testimony, we have heard extensively about the Chinese Communist Party's illicit use of transnational repression against its own diaspora, concerned about that, and the foreign malign influence campaigns directed at the people of the United States, tactics that are repressive, coercive, and even criminal. What have we learned about these operations and how do we intend to counter this, these disinformation campaigns, protect our homeland, and prevent these attacks from undermining our free market activities and our democratic institutions? Go at it, whichever one is gonna answer first. And the last, uh, how can we best prevent these activities from disrupting our free market activities and our democratic institutions? And somebody should comment on the dangers of AI with respect to the Chinese. If you could uh, start, you want the FBI to start, Ms. Murphy? I'll yield to Homeland Security. Thank you. Mr. Kahanga, Thank Kama? you. Thank you for the question. So I think in the remaining time, one program I would like to highlight is a recently announced high-risk community protection in initiative from our cybersecurity infrastructure security agency. So it's engaging diaspora civil society groups and communities in the United States, understanding the threats, and then offering them cybersecurity services, including from things like spyware that may be leveraged to otherwise undermine them in this country. Uh, Mr. Durham, the gentleman quickly. Was, what, what? And she, he. Gentle lady's time has expired. Answer the question what? if my mouth was moving. <laughs> Mr. Durham, would you just give a word? The chairman is being very kind. He's a fellow Texan, and, I'll, and I will step back and thank him. I'll step back thank and you, thank him. Thank you, Congresswoman. Congresswoman, uh, I, I will say this about the PRC. They are, are very aggressive in their activities, and they will use every technique, tool, or procedure within their toolbox to ensure that they accomplish their goals. And they will turn those tools against diaspora communities as well. It is not uncommon for them to do it. And we, as my colleagues have just said, are working with those communities to help them understand the threats. And for your courtesy, and ranking member for your courtesy. I thank the gentle lady. Our time has expired and the chair uh, will now move into a second round uh, of questioning. And we have other members who I know will be rejoining uh, at, at a variety of points. Um, Chair, now recognize myself for an additional five minutes of questioning. Um, I'd like to enter into the record uh, the letter that I sent on the 24th, uh, excuse me, on the 17th of April uh, about the um, police station in New York um, and the request for that, so ordered. Um, additionally, I'd like to reiterate uh, from the chair's perspective uh, to reflect my opening statement today and also in our previous hearing, the very first hearing that we had on this topic, um, what many of my colleagues have asserted, which is this has absolutely everything to do with the malign influence of the Chinese Communist Party and not of its people, uh, and especially of those uh, of any sort of Chinese descent that may live here or in any other diaspora around the world. Uh, but I think it is fascinating to hear all three of you say that every ta tactic, technique, and procedure, um, as Mr. Durham just said, um, that they are very aggressive and every tool will be used, which I think is why we are here. Um, I'll get into uh, some questions from Ms. Murphy. Um, Are you aware that in November of 2018, DOJ's China Initiative was established to address some of the most critical threats to national security posed by the Chinese Communist Party, and that this initiative sought to raise awareness and to identify and prosecute Chinese trade secret theft and economic espionage, as well as to protect American critical infrastructure and supply chains from covert influence? Yes, sir, I'm aware of that initiative. Do you agree with the former Attorney General that about 80% of all federal economic espionage prosecutions have alleged conduct that would benefit the Chinese state and about 60% of all U.S. trade secret theft cases have had a nexus to China? I, I can't confirm nor deny that, but that, you know, in general, wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. I mean, you were working in the department at that time. At the, at the FBI, yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Um, do, do you agree in general that the connections are, are vast? Yes, absolutely. Do you agree with your uh, boss, FBI Director Ray, that the greatest long-term threat to our nation's information and intellectual property and to our economic vitality is the counterintelligence and economic espionage threat from China? Yes, sir, absolutely. Is it true that the FBI launches a counterintelligence case into China as often as once every 12 hours? I, I don't know the exact numbers, but we, all, we have a lot of 
Chinese counterintelligence investigations. Many, it's probably about half of the work that we do in the counterintelligence wow. division. Half. About how many ongoing investigations would you say? Uh, I don't know that I can give you in a specific number, but I'd say over 2,000. Over 2,000. Yes, sir. Incredible. Uh, is it true that the Director of National Security Agency under President Obama, Keith Alexander, has called the Chinese state theft of U.S. intellectual property the greatest transfer of wealth in history? I think so. Yes, I, I believe okay. that that's true. Um, Ms. Murphy, my question is this. Um, as, as I mentioned previously, uh, you, you've mentioned that the CCP will use any tactic, technique, procedure. Um, are they trying to influence industry leaders, key government leaders, people that have influence inside the United States? I can't think of a specific example off the top of my head. Um, you know, but they, they definitely wield influence. I don't know if they're- Are they trying to influence certain people that they can bring into harmonization with what the CCP is trying to do to undermine our own national security? Is it in their interest to, to, to gather people inside the United States, whether they be government officials or industry leaders. As my colleague from Texas just mentioned, you're the counterintelligence deputy director, so. No, I, I understand, but what I'm trying to think through is they certainly try to influence innovation and get into a space to so take So do they not try to property. influence people? No, they certainly try to influence. I'm, I'm just trying to think through, so I would say Confu Confucius Institute would be one way that they try to influence people. They'd certainly use tactics to repress their own people. Have they tried to garner favor so that they can influence government leaders for their own benefits to undermine U.S. national security? Would this be a tactic they would do? I think that's probably the, a question for a closed session, sir. Ms. Murphy, I think that the American people are having a hard time with the Department of Justice right now because of answers to questions like this. This is very simple. Ask a thousand people in our country this same question and they're gonna say, of course they're trying to do that. Do you have knowledge of this? Yes, sir, I think that's better for a closed session. I'd, I'd like to remind the witnesses that you're testifying under oath. I understand that. Do you have awareness of the CCP trying to use malign influence by, by g gaining favor with government or industry leaders in the United States? Sir, I think we'd have to take that to a closed session. Well, I look forward to that. We have multiple letters that we have sent to you that have gone unresponded to, uh, including something that was previously uh, discussed. And I look forward to the Confucius Institute um, discussion as well. My time has expired. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Magaziner. Thank you, Chairman. You know, I think we're touching on uh, some important issues here. I mean, foreign malign influence is a real threat, and it takes many forms. Uh, it can take the form of trying to influence individuals in key positions. Uh, it can also take the form of trying to influence public opinion in a variety of ways. And that is why I believe it is entirely appropriate that in Ms. Murphy's written testimony, she highlighted the issue of foreign malign influence from the CCP. And let's be clear, here in this country, we value the First Amendment, we value our individual freedoms, but the First Amendment does not apply to foreign governments trying to stoke division in our country. It does not apply to foreign governments trying to influence individual Americans. It doesn't apply to foreign governments at all, as a matter of fact, nor does it apply to anyone, foreign or domestic, who's engaging in criminal activity like plotting acts of violence. And so, it is absolutely appropriate and important that we support the work of rooting out foreign malign influence that is seeking to do things like influence public opinion in the favor of the CCP or individuals. And my hope, again, is that this conversation can continue to be a bipartisan one. I could certainly spend my whole five minutes talking about uh, the former president and his family's business dealings in China, uh, which are well documented. But I think we can all at least agree that uh, whatever the political affiliation is of our elected officials, hopefully in the future, people will exercise better judgment in discretion in who they decide to do business with and avoiding doing business with individuals who may be aligned with governments that are adversaries of the United States. So, uh, listen, at, at a high level, 
That is why this work is so important. We have to make sure that across agencies, we are doing everything in our power to limit the ability of the CCP to undermine our democratic values, to undermine our economy, and to undermine our national security. So uh, with all of that being said, um, either Mr. Durham or uh, Mr. Kahangama, can you just give us a summary of what the 90-day DHS sprint entails? What is the work that is being done at DHS right now to escalate our ability to defend against the CCP threat? Thank you for the question, I'm happy to answer it. So as, uh, as was mentioned, the 90-day sprint involves a concerted department-wide uh, focus on six key areas uh, to counter the threat from the PRC and the homeland. This includes critical countering their pursuit of critical infrastructure, their economic coercion, countering their role in uh, fentanyl uh, coming across our border, uh, securing our screening and vetting systems to make sure they're able to identify those risks, countering the PRC's movement and activities in the Arctic, and then making sure we're maximizing our counterintelligence information sharing against uh, PRC-based counterintelligence threats. I think what I'd like to emphasize is that, you know, these activities are what the Secretary is using to focus the department and to, to elevate things that we've already been doing, make maximum and efficient use, just like uh, our State Department and CIA and others are, are, are centralizing their China and PRC-based activities. Uh, it's to set a stronger foundation for longer term uh, uh, activities to counter these. It's uh, part of an endeavor to work with interagency partners and the private sector and really to infuse the PRC into every aspect of our mission set because we've come, it's been made quite clear that the PRC threatens all aspects of our mission. So reorienting and pivoting the department uh, to that threat for long term uh, awareness is part of that campaign. Thank you. And I only have limited time left. I spent most of my first round of questions focused on the issue of IP theft against uh, US companies. Uh, another persistent cyber threat from the CCP uh, is uh, their attempts to infiltrate critical, critical infrastructure, uh, particularly utilities. Can you just speak briefly about that threat and about DHS's actions to mitigate it? Thank you. Uh, I would say that the, the threat of PRC intrusions into our critical infrastructure is the most pressing concern we would have with regards to the PRC. Their potential ability to gain access and hold our decision making at risk in light of a conflict is of utmost concern. We are actively working to ensure that we are engaged with critical infrastructure owners to patch systems, to share information, to turn off systems that are, are actively being exploited and making sure that we take a whole of government approach, whether that involves working with partners from DOD, uh, the DOJ, uh, Department of Commerce, and others. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Murphy, does the FBI have any recommendations or opinion about members of Congress making use of TikTok? Sir, I don't know that the FBI has an opinion on members of Congress using uh, TikTok as an application. I think you're probably aware that the FBI employees are not allowed to put TikTok on their FBI-issued government devices. Mm. and that why, we only, why is that? Because we only allowed approved apps uh, on our government device. And I think that the committee is probably aware of the threat that the FBI perceives from TikTok or a nation state like China having access to data to millions of Americans. Is there, would there be any reason to believe that that threat would not also apply if members of Congress are using TikTok? No, there would be no reason not to think that that wouldn't be a threat to Congress. Um, um, Ms. Murphy, you, uh, do you have any responsibility for the FBI's FISA 702 database uh, use? I don't, I don't have any responsibility uh, for the database, no. Well, all right. Uh, maybe I, my question was not very clear. Let me let me ask it this way. Uh, at Reuters article uh, a couple of days ago said that he, uh, points out that the FISA court, in an opinion issued in April 2021, just released by uh, declassified and released by the ODNI, um, found that the FBI improperly searched for information in a U.S. database of foreign intelligence 278,000 times over several years, including on. Americans suspected of crimes, according to a, re a ruling released Friday. 
Are you conversant with that subject matter? No, sir. We have a, a person that's assigned specifically to deal with the 702 matter. At the Who's that? His name is Mike Harrington. Okay. And you do not have that within your purview then? Not, not the specific thing that you're talking about, no. Uh, or would you be aware of, of uh, the, well, you would not be able to speak to, for example, changes that have been made by the FBI to prevent the abuses that the FISA court described in its order. Correct? So I, I know that we've implemented significant changes. For instance, I know that the numbers that the FBI has queried on U.S. person information acquired under FISA 702 uh, in 2022 was approximately 204,000, and that represented a 93, almost 94 percent drop year over year from 2021. There's been sort of a pattern. It was three million, and, and then this order talked about it being 278,000. But there've been a series of events where the 702 database use has been critiqued by the FISA court. Americans only learn about it subsequently. Why should Americans be confident now uh, that that the use of the database is appropriate if these things, if previous steps have been taken to uh, uh, correct the abuses, but it continues to happen according to the FISA court? So I think the FISA court, sir, is different than FISA 702. Uh, applications that go in front of the FISA court are full FISAs. No, no, no. The FISA court was the court issued the opinion that said the 702 database has been being abused by the FBI. You're aware of that, aren't you? Yes, sir. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. The FISA court has repeatedly said the FBI is abusing its, its uh, access to the 702 database. Why should Americans be convinced that now the FBI is rectified that, whereas it didn't before? Sir, I don't know the details of that report, but what I would tell you is that the FBI strives uh, to protect the American people, and when there's policies or procedures in place that, that are identified to have... I, I'm, I'm really looking for specifics. Okay, never. Let me ask this question. Does anyone on the panel know the holding of the Supreme Court case Lamont versus Postmaster General in 1965? Just to clue you in, it's, it's the case that deals with whether Americans have a First Amendment right of access to foreign propaganda. Is none of you aware of that case? Uh, Mr. Kahangama, do you have any responsibility for the MDM team at the Department of Homeland Security, the, the one that deals with misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation? I do not. Okay. Mr. Durham, do you have any responsibility for that? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. I have a team at DHS that looks at foreign malign activities, yes. Explain what that is, please, or what, so, what, what, the, what your team does. Uh, my team looks at various efforts of the CCP, Russia, and other foreign nations, and how they attempt to influence uh, opinions, win the hearts and minds of individuals in the U.S., and engage in activities that would ultimately be in does, their benefit and does DHS continue to switch board uh, in the testimony of, uh, of one of your officials on the MDM team? Sir, I'm not aware of any switch boarding. I'm not in position to address that question. My time has expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Crane. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> chairman. Um, I want to I want to make a comment about something that one of my colleagues who just left the room said. You know, he made a reference to the former president of the United States and his family and their known business dealings in China and other places. You know, I found it interesting because one of the biggest differences between the Trump family and their foreign business dealings and the Biden family and their foreign, foreign business dealings is that the Trump family actually owns businesses. They actually own hotels and resorts, okay? Pretty stark difference from what we're learning, what many of us knew and now we're actually learning as the Oversight and Judiciary Committee actually get to uh, bring in witnesses. You know, the sad thing is for everybody in this room, everybody in this room, everybody in this town, everybody in this country knows that if the FBI and our DOJ had the type of damning information, hard evidence, bank records, et cetera, on the money laundering that this president, his family have been up to the last couple years, and their names were Eric and Don Jr., we wouldn't even be having this hearing. You know why? They'd be in jail. 
And this is exactly the type of thing I was talking about, Ms. Murphy. And this is exactly why so many of your colleagues have had enough and they've become whistleblowers. Ms. Murphy, what do you think about that? So many of your colleagues have had enough. What do you think about the whistleblowers that just said, I can't do it anymore? I can't cover for the organization, the institution that I work for because I didn't swear an oath to them. I actually swore an oath to the United States and the Constitution. What do you think about that, ma'am? Does it, do you feel like they betrayed the institution? Or are you glad that they're up here? Sir, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, I am, I'm proud and I'm happy that we live in a country where there's whistleblower protection acts and that people can come forward when they think things have done, been done incorrectly. You know, like I support the FBI. I think the FBI does amazing work. You know, ma'am, I think they do do some amazing work, too. But I think we both know that its, it's reputation is massively tarnished. And I think we're both glad that we have whistleblower provisions in this country. But I think if we weren't, you weren't under oath and we weren't wearing these clothes and in this room right now and we were having a private conversation, I sure hope there's part of you that is embarrassed and disgusted with what the FBI has been up to. And I know the American people are. I mean, look at, look at the movies growing up. You guys are in like every movie as the hero. When, when you were a little girl and you were watching movies growing up, did you notice that? that those, those cool blue jackets with the bright yellow lettering, the FBI on it. Did, was, that pretty, was that pretty cool watching those movies growing up and those TV shows and now getting to work for this organization? It's amazing to work for this organization. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is there a part of you, though, is there a part of you, though, that feels torn, ma'am, like, like the whistleblowers that are coming up here now in droves that just say, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I didn't swear an oath to the FBI. Is there a part of you that feels torn or not at all? Ma'am, I'm asking you a serious question. Sir, I'm very proud to work for the FBI. I think I stated that. I, I know you are. That's not what I asked you, ma'am. I asked you if you feel torn. Not at the least. Not the slightest. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's pretty sad, ma'am. That really is. And it really shows who your allegiances are to. It really does. And as somebody who served this country myself, and comes, I come from a very proud unit, the SEAL teams. I know that my allegiances are not to NSW, Naval Special Warfare. They're not to a SEAL team. And I am glad. I am so proud that we have men and women who see their oath to this country and they said, I can't do it anymore. I'm going to go try and straighten this out so that the organization that I love can maybe, just maybe, be turned around Quit being a partisan tool and actually protect the American people, which it clearly is not doing right now. Thank you. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields. Um, the chair will now enter to a third round of questioning and recognizes myself for uh, five minutes of questioning. I'd like to enter into the record um, the annual threat assessment by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And it basically goes to the, the previous question that I mentioned. And let me just read Malign Influence Operations, what this ODNI sa uh, report says. It says, Beijing has adjusted by redoubling its efforts to build influence at the state and local level to shift U.S. policy in China's favor because of Beijing's belief that local officials are more pliable than their federal counterparts. PRC actors have become more aggressive with their influence campaigns. It goes on to talk about, and I'll enter this into the record, um, it goes on to talk about uh, other tactics, techniques, and procedures. Ms. Murphy, you mentioned um, the work that, uh, uh, that, that the FBI has done on Confucius Institutes. I'm proud to sponsor a bill and legislation that gets at the heart of Confucius Institutes. Do you believe that the CCP is using malign influence to affect outcomes of research and other 
uh, academia outcomes at our universities and, and uh, higher institution at universities? Sir, so I don't, I don't know if I'd say it's to affect the outcomes, but probably more to steal the research. Okay. Um, on May 12, 2023, Special Counsel John Durham submitted a 300-page report to Attorney General Garland examining the FBI's investigation into alleged links between the 2016 Trump campaign and Russian efforts to interfere in the presidential election. Ms. Murphy, does your department deal with uh, counterintelligence, specifically elections? The counterintelligence division does, yes, sir. So you, you but it works it along with um, uh, another division that deals with election security. So your division deals with counterintelligence and has access to election security? So election security isn't owned by the counterintelligence division. There's a specific part of the FBI that deals with election security. Um, but we work with that, that piece of the FBI in regards to protecting elections and obviously with DHS. Special Counsel Durham assessed that neither U.S. law enforcement nor the intelligence community appears to have possessed any actual evidence of collusion in their holdings at the commencement of the Crossfire Hurricane investigation. And the Bureau subsequently discounted or willfully ignored material that did not support the narrative of a collusive relationship between Trump and Russia. As the Deputy Assistant Director for the FBI's Counterintelligence Division, are you familiar with this report? I have not read that report, sir. You have not read the Durham report? I have not yet read the Durham report, no, sir. I'm honestly speechless at this point in time. Uh, I'm not sure what to think of this as someone who has spent an entire career in counterintelligence. Um, Special Counsel Durham found that the FBI moved too quickly with its investigation of the 2016 campaign and relied on uncorroborated evidence when launching its investigation. Does this concern you? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? That, that there was a very fast pace of the investigation and that uncorroborated evidence was used when launching the investigation. Does that concern you? So again, sir, I haven't read the Durham report, so I'm not sure, you know, I have no knowledge of. of it is, does this fall under the counterintelligence umbrella? The Durham report? I'm sure portions of it do, yes, sir. Does, does a suggestion or uh, an accusation of election collusion between a foreign government and the United States or an, a person or an entity in the United States fall under counterintelligence? Yes, sir. So the alleged collusion between Mr. Trump in 2016 and Russia would have fallen under the counterintelligence division of the FBI? Yes, sir. And you have not read the Durham report I have not read the Durham report. Is no, there sir. a reason? Is it not required to? No, I just haven't had time. Ms. Murphy, do you actively investigate counterintelligence with foreign entities around the world? Yes, sir. Um, and this is a sincere question. Does election collusion worry you? Yeah, obviously election collusion would worry me, yes, sir. Does any malign influence to the United States worry you? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I would highly recommend reading that because we spent four years discussing that. There was uncorroborated evidence. The Durham report specifically outlines the outcome of that. It's very disappointing to hear this. Um, and I think this is why uh, we, we have these discussions and, and questions. Um, The chair's time has expired, and uh, I now recognize uh, the gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Goldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, perfect timing, because I'd like to address uh, some of what the chairman just addressed and some of what my colleague from Arizona addressed in attacking the FBI. First, let's talk about the Durham report. Uh, I'll, I'll make it real short for you, Ms. Murphy. Um, the Durham report seemed to fail to consider the fact that the original tip that set off the opera, uh, Crossfire Hurricane investigation was that Russia would be disseminating hacked emails about uh, related that would help Donald Trump. And lo and behold, at the end of July, that's exactly what happened. So the Durham report focused solely on what was internally 
within the intelligence files of the FBI and did not mention the obvious corroboration that the tip turned out to be true. Second, the Durham report said that an investigation was justified to be opened. It should have just been a preliminary investigation as opposed to a full investigation. Third, the Durham report talks all about the Steele dossier, which had nothing to do with the origination of the Russia investigation and had nothing to do with the Mueller investigation. It was not relied on. That investigation, of course, led to, I believe, six individuals connected to the Trump campaign who were convicted, whereas the Durham report, the Durham investigation, uh, had one guilty plea by someone who was referred from the Office of Inspector General and two acquittals on pretty pathetic charges. So let's get our facts straight about the Durham report. Second, I want to address what my colleague from Arizona was saying about the FBI whistleblowers. Uh, I was actually in that hearing last week, he was not. And what I can tell you about those individuals is separate and apart from whether they are whistleblowers or not, they were deemed by the FBI to be national security risks because one uh, allowed his own personal views of January 6th to affect his official duties by not turning over to his super superior open source information that ultimately, ultimately led a different agent to determine that a subject was actually at the Capitol committing violence on January 6th. Second, another one, another special agent, decided that he was the legal expert on what a legitimate grand jury subpoena was and was not and refused to serve a grand jury subpoena on a witness that had been issued by uh, the grand jury with the support of a federal prosecutor and his supervisory agent, and yet he decided that he knew best, and so he refused to do that. These people, my colleague wants to talk about being a, a partisan tool, I think, is what he used. Sadly, and perhaps unwittingly, the, the partisan tool here is someone who is Donald Trump's henchman funding these witnesses to try to diminish and uh, undermine the FBI. And why are they trying to diminish and undermine the FBI at Donald Trump's direction and behest? Because the FBI is investigating Donald Trump. That is what we're doing here. That is why, and I see my colleague from Georgia, who I'm sure is waved on to this committee. The committee will suspend. I would, I would advise members that under Clause 1 of Rule 17 of the Rules of the House, they must observe the House standards of decorum and debate and conduct. They must act and speak respectfully and may not use disorderly words, unparliamentary language, such as words impugning the motives of their colleagues or words that are partially or, or personally offensive. Gentlemen, uh, yield back to the gentleman from New York. Could I have my minute back since you suspended? Yes, the, the, the time was approximately a minute and 15, minute and 20. Thank you. Appreciate it. So why are my colleagues trying to undermine the FBI? Why are they asking to defund the FBI? It is not because the FBI is not doing its job. It's because the FBI is doing its job. And the problem they have is that the FBI is doing its job in investigating their dear leader, Donald Trump. And if you can undermine the investigator, if you can undermine independent journalists doing investigative reporting, then you can undermine our entire system of democracy. That is the authoritarian playbook 101. You attack the democratic institutions, you attack the independent objective individuals who provide checks and balance in a democracy, and then rather than follow the law and the rules, you can violate the law and the rules because there's no one with any credibility who can hold you in check. So do you wanna know the reason why the FBI 
is going down in its credibility, it's because it's being attacked by people on the other side of the aisle. Gentleman's and that has expired. to stop. I yield back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop. Ms. Murphy, um, I uh, also was surprised at your answer that you haven't read the Durham report. Uh, do you consider the Durham report content? Oh, let me ask this. Have you been briefed on the report? That was a no. Your mic sounds like it's off. Is it working? No, sir. There we go. So you haven't been briefed on it. Have you, have you read even the executive summary? No, sir. Here's a, here's a portion. Our investigation determined that the Crossfire Hurricane investigators did not and could not corroborate any of the substantive allegations contained in the Steele reporting, nor was Steele able to produce corroboration for any of the reported allegations, even after being offered $1 million or more by the FBI for such corroboration. Further, when interviewed by the FBI in 20, January 2017, Danchenko, he's the primary subsource, also was unable to corroborate any of the substantive allegations in the reports. It, it, th that is just a sample. Um, and I, and uh, I, I know uh, Mr. Goldman spent a good bit of time uh, attempting to sort of uh, denigrate the Durham report for understandable reasons. Uh, it, it, is, it is devastating to the FBI. That seems to me that that would be, and since it was a counterintelligence investigation, that the special counsel appointed by the Department of Justice has uh, summarized in uh, terms like that, um, that that would be of grave concern to you as a deputy director of the FBI responsible for counterintelligence. Can you explain why, I, and you said you haven't had time to read it. It's been out since the 12th of this month. Uh, so almost, I guess, what is this, the 23rd? Uh, so 11 days. Uh, most, uh, Mr. Goldman's obviously been briefed on it or read it. Many members of Congress have. Why is that not a matter of such import that you would want urgently to understand what the special counsel concluded about the work of the counterintelligence division in such a grave case? Sir, if you'd like a brief on the Durham report from the counterintelligence division, I'm happy to take that back. Wow. That sounds almost contemptuous. Let me ask you this then, uh, just go back to your, what you've written in your uh, submitted testimony to, the, to this committee today. Uh, and I, I was a little bit stuck on the first round of questioning, but let me just go back to it. It is, it is your uh, testimony. Let me begin at the end of paragraph, or uh, the third page of your testimony. It says, to address, you're ta this was talking about more malign influence. And again, I think you said that you don't really have much responsibility for that, but surely you must know the details behind this. Um, you said, utilizing lessons learned since 2018, the FITF widened its aperture to confront malign foreign operations of the PRC, Iran, and other global adversaries. To address this expanding focus and wider set of adversaries and influence efforts, we have also added resources to maintain permanent surge capability on election and foreign influence threats. Can you explain the details behind that, please? Sir, I think when we're talking about surging resources, I think it's the permanent staffing of the Foreign Intelligence uh, Task Force. So what does it mean to be, what's surge capability? That sounds like something that you can add people when you need it. I think we did surge, and I think now we've made those positions permanent. I see. So you've made there, there's permanent surge capability. So if you ever need to surge, you got people permanently employed to do whatever you may need to interfere with the, uh, the election. Um, how about, um, yeah, that's just astonishing. Um, I'm just without words, uh, that the FBI is unconcerned. Are there, do you know whether any, anybody at the FBI has read the Durham report? I'm sure people have read the Durham report, sir. Uh, can you name anybody that you know has read it? No, sir. Do you intend to read it? I do intend to read it. Uh, does the FBI intend to undertake any changes in the way it conducts counterintelligence operations based on the Durham report? I, I can't answer that, sir. I can take that question back. I yield. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Crane. Uh, 
I'm going to yield my time to the gentlewoman from Georgia. The gentleman yields to the lady from Georgia, Ms. Taylor Green. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate you guys coming to, to speak to the committee today, and thank you very much for letting me wave on. Um, just a few months ago, our nation watched in absolute horror while a Chinese spy balloon traversed across the United States of America, um, spying on our military bases, our country's infrastructure, uh, uh, just surveilling everything that China could take in uh, as it traveled across the United States and the Biden administration did absolutely nothing. And Americans were so upset. The outrage was unbelievable. Um, and then finally, finally, the spy balloon gets shot down over the Atlantic after China completed its mission um, and come to find out after they picked up the pieces out of the ocean that there, and they knew from uh, pictures they were taking, that this device was sending back images and information back to China. Um, it, it's, it's shock, it's almost unspeakable. It's unspeakable that this actually happened. Um, in 2018, the Department of Justice announced the China Initiative to combat the CCP's relentless campaign to steal U.S. intelligence, technology, and cutting-edge research. Um, Ms. Murphy, I, I share uh, my colleague's shock that you haven't read the Durham report, um, so I'm not sure how much you know about the, Ch the China initiative under President Trump's administration, but I think it was very important, as well do many Americans who feel threatened by China. China wants to re replace us economically, and they're doing a pretty damn good job of it. China wants to beat us militarily, and they have the fastest growing military in world history. So Americans that exist and live and pay all the taxes outside of this city truly feel threatened by China, and we're greatly appreciative of the Trump administration that had the China initiative. In March 2022, even FBI Director Christopher Wray, who's loyal completely to the left and, and, and trying to go after their political enemies, admitted that the Bureau had more than 2,000 China-related cases and was opening a new China-related case every 12 hours. Um, in spite of this, the, despite the clear need for a mission focusing on CCP threats, Assistant Attorney General Matthew Olson ended the China initiative based on accusations that the investigations under the initiative were excessive or racially biased. Ms. Murphy, you have quite an extensive career, and I would think you would understand the threats that China poses to us. Do you agree with Attorney General Matthew Olson ending the China initiative? Thank you for the question. I think the, I agree, the, the threat from the Chinese Communist government is massive um, and something that we need to take very seriously uh, in all levels of our government and our private and pro, um, public sectors. I think the, the China initiative is something that uh, was misperceived by our Chinese community to be against Chinese people. I think that concept behind the Chinese initiative was to protect uh, academic institutions and research from the Chinese communist government. I think the, mm -hmm. the things that we're doing to protect research in universities and innovation continues in that space. And if people are doing criminal acts um, or grant fraud, then we're working with those institutions to take corrective action or criminal prosecutions. Well, Ms. Murphy, um, protecting our national security and protecting our country from everything, protecting our intelligence, protecting our technology, protecting America's interests has nothing to do with anyone's race or, or any type of identity. The China Initiative um, wasn't any type of anything to go against Chinese Americans. Uh, this was all about fighting the CCP. So would you agree that this initiative needs to be put back in place? I would say that the work that we're doing in that area continues. Well, I don't think it's good enough because obviously FBI Director, for, Director Christopher Wray 
has admitted that more than 2,000 related cases uh, have been opened, and now there's a China-related case every 12 hours. So I would say that you all are failing at your the mission. The I, gentleman's time has expired. Yes, I, I yield back to Mr. Crane. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I yield back. The, the chair now recognizes Ms. Green for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to... I would like to continue talking about this uh, Chinese spy balloon here for, for just a minute. It's, it is truly shocking. Um, senior U.S. government officials uh, reported in February 2023 uh, that the Chinese spy balloon was able to gather intelligence from several sensitive homeland defense, defense sites resulting from the Biden administration's of course, willful refusal, shocking refusal, something that Americans just do not understand, uh, can't comprehend why it wasn't shot, shot down. Uh, given it's a proven fact that the Biden family has been receiving payments uh, from our oversight investigation from CCP-linked foreign nationals in exchange for power and influence, this could very well be strategic sabotage by the CCP-basically-owned White House um, I would like to ask you, uh, Mr. Kahangama, do you think that this is a national security threat against our homeland? Thank you for the question. Uh, while I would defer some of the intelligence uh, questions to my colleague in the intelligence community, I would say that the ability of the high altitude balloon to conduct surveillance from the CCP perspective is a threat to our country. Right, but given the fact that we've seen money transferred from China into LLCs and then that money being paid out to multiple Biden family members, um, that, that is a clear, it actually puts our country at risk, our entire national security at risk when that's happening. And that's proven in bank statements. It, it has been shown in uh, financial reports that exist in the Treasury that we've reviewed. And I think it's very serious. Um, what kinds of vulnerabilities to sensitive homeland security sites and critical infrastructure were likely created as a result of this intelligence breach? Thank you for the question, ma'am. I would say the use of the high altitude balloon is just one more tool, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, with regard to the CCP's toolbox. Uh, they use everything at their disposal and a high altitude balloon is just one more of them. It's, it's also seen as perhaps a provocative action of theirs, the same way they are engaged in provocative activities in the uh, South China Sea and Taiwan Straits. So uh, with regard to the uh, vulnerabilities, there's certainly some concern about the imagery that may have been collected or that's possibly, that, that's possible to be collected uh, from such a balloon over critical infrastructure, over military installations and such. But at this point, I'm not in position to say any more about what those individual vulnerabilities are. Uh, and I would defer to uh, my colleagues at the FBI and specifically in DOD who have oversight of the actual balloon and are engaging in the actual research an analysis of the tools that were on it. Okay, well, Ms. Murphy, I would ask you then what, um, since you're, I guess you're deferring to Ms. Murphy, is that correct? Ma'am, not necessarily Ms. Murphy, but the other folks at the FBI who are working with elements at DOD okay. to uh, provide some. All right, well, I'll ask all three of you, since all of you receive taxpayer-funded paychecks, just like I do, how do you think the American people feel about a, a spy balloon going all the way across the country, taking pictures of God knows what. The American people have no idea. Um, they wanted it shot down, scream for it shot down. So, so what do we have to say to the American taxpayers who work very hard for the money that they earn, pay the IRS their tax dollars that pay all of our paychecks, pay for this building, the lights that turn on, and all of the research and everything to do with this entire thing. I'll go one at a time. What do you all have to say to the American people on that failure? Ms. Murphy? I'd say the FBI is working very hard to protect the American people. Do you think the American people trust the FBI, Ms. Murphy? 
Yes, ma'am, I do. I'm gonna tell you they don't. Yes, sir. I would say that the, the high altitude balloon posed a threat and it was shot down and we are working with the investigative agencies to determine the specifics of that. Thank you. Ma'am, I would say that the people at INA, the analysts here, are working diligently to ensure that we share any and all threat information with those individuals across the nation who are in position to mitigate those threats. Well, the, the tragic news for our country is they already have, China has already collected everything they need and their mission was successful while our government's mission failed the American people. Mr. Chair, Chair I yield back. Thank you. The gentle lady's time has expired. I'd like to thank the witnesses for your time, for your service, for coming to this committee and talking about a very important issue. Mr. Chairman, before you close, could I be recognized for a unanimous consent request? Yes. Just briefly, I'm sorry, yes, Mr. Chairman, to uh, submit for the record, Democrat, uh, uh, New York Post article from May 18, 2023, Democrats attack was FBI whistleblowers giving cover to the agency's abuses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So ordered. Thank you. Um, the members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions or the witnesses, and we would ask the witnesses to respond in writing uh, to these uh, in a reasonable amount of time. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7 Delta, the hearing record will be open for an additional 10 days. Without objection, the subcommittee